Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the COGGI webinar that we hold periodically. Uh, we appreciate the, uh, your attendance. We got quite a lot of interest in today's um, uh, presentation, um, and so I, I'm sure you're going to find it quite interesting. Um, I'm Alan Marr. I am the uh, chair of the Committee on Geological and Geotechnical Engineering, uh, which is a standing committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, and uh, particularly the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. This uh, committee was established to be the focal point for the National Academies for Government, Industry, and Academia uh, on technical and public policy issues related to uh, earth processes and materials, uh, um, soil and rock mechanics, uh, human responsible human development, and mitigation of natural and human hazards. Um, if you have questions about the committee, please contact uh, Samantha Magsino, uh, who acts as our staff director for the committee and does a very able job for us. Um, this webinar is part of the quarterly series that is produced by the committee, uh, COGI, uh, through the support of the National Science Foundation, which we greatly appreciate. Um, the, without their support, we couldn't do this. Um, and the webinar will be posted on YouTube. Uh, an announcement will be sent out to all those of you who are registered as soon as it's available, and that's usually just a few days. Uh, you can open your chats to send messages um, uh, and, and receive messages from us if necessary and to uh, see the speaker's bio um, in more detail. Uh, Sam and Emily Bermudez uh, set up this webinar and uh, uh, Mandy Enriquez is producing it, and without their help, this would just not work. They they usually make it go quite quite flawless. So uh, thanks for their help in advance, because when this ends, I it ends abruptly, and I won't have time to give uh, or an opportunity to give thanks, except to our speaker. Um, we will have time for Q and A uh, after the presentation. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q and A tab on the Zoom panel uh, that you'll find on your screen. And I will pose as many questions out of this, those you present. I'll try to organize them and moderate them uh, and, and, and ask as many as the time permits. We do try to end pretty close to the hour. Um, I need to say that any opinions, conclusions, and recommendations expressed by the, by, uh, the, the presenter uh, or even by any of the questioners um, in this webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. So with all of that to begin with, um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Ro Lo excuse me, Lord Robert Meyer. Um, he is the founding head of the Center for Smart Infrastructure and Construction at Cambridge University in Cambridge, England. He's also Professor Emeritus of Civil Engineering um, at Cambridge University. Um, he l worked in industry for 27 years where he had founded or was a key player in the uh, what is called the Geotechnical Consulting Group, GCG, still a very active firm uh, in uh, England and doing worldwide projects. Um, he, in 1998, was appointed Professor of Geotechnical Engineering at Cambridge and head of the Civil Engineering Group. Um, he um, has had ex extensive experience in design and construction of a wide variety of civil engineering projects in many countries, particularly those involving geotechnical engineers in underground construction. He was president of the Institution of Civil Engineers from uh, 2017 to 2018. He's a fellow in the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society, and the United States Academy of um, National Academy of Engineering. Uh, he was appointed as what's called an independent cross venture in the House of Lords in 2015, which means his title is literally Lord Meyer. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, and I, I like to tease him a little bit about uh, the only Lord I know in the world. <laughs> and uh, and I, I feel it a real privilege to, uh, to talk and work with Robert. Uh, we're very privileged to have him here present today uh, to talk about some of his professional experiences, particularly on a major tunneling project in London uh, that's been completed and opened called Crossrail. And so with that, uh, we, we're delighted to have you and look forward to your comments, uh, Robert. Alan, thank you very much for your introduction. 
it's a pleasure to be speaking to to Coggy uh, this afternoon. So my lecture is going to be about the Crossrail project in London, which has recently been renamed the Elizabeth Line in honor of our late Queen, Queen Elizabeth. And so when I'm talking about Crossrail uh, throughout this talk, uh, it is in now, in fact, called the Elizabeth Line. So um, I'm going to give you an outline of, of my talk. I'm just waiting for the slide to change here. Here we go. So I'm going to talk about the Crossrail project, uh, the importance of geology. Um, I'm going to say some, some things about the tunneling techniques and some of the innovations. I'm going to then go on to talk about settlement effects of tunneling, because this was right underneath central London and prevention of damage to buildings. And I'll be talking about some advances in the technique compensation grouting. And I'm then going to focus on some tunneling effects on pile foundations. Quite a number of buildings uh, are on piles and some of the tunnels uh, went very close beneath the piles. And I'm going to describe, describe what we learned from that. And I'm going to finish with some innovative fiber optic monitoring uh, of underground infrastructure, specifically uh, on the Crossrail project. So it was Europe's largest infrastructure project. It involves 21 kilometers of new twin bore, seven meter diameter railway tunnels right under central London. Uh, you can see on this plan, the red part uh, are all underground. And uh, there are a number of stations. There are eight new subsurface stations uh, shown in the big red, uh, the big red circles. It's part of a much bigger scheme that actually links all the way from Heathrow Airport uh, right into central London. And when it arrives uh, at Paddington, uh, it, it goes underground. And it splits towards the east. You can see uh, in, in, uh, on two different lines so what I'm going to show you now is a snapshot of the geology. And before I do that, um, I want to emphasize that the vertical scale is in tens of meters. The horizontal scale is in kilometers, in other words, hundreds of meters, so very distorted. Now, what you're seeing here is the, the line of the tunnel and the stations winding its way through and I'm going to in a minute just scan right across the project but this big brown um, light brown uh, stratum you're looking at here is London clay and it's a very well known um, stiff uh, over consolidated clay which is highly appropriate for being able to tunnel in almost uh, open face conditions. It's extremely strong clay. However, as we go further to the right of this, you'll see that as I, as I get this moving, you'll see that the, the geology changes. If you follow the line of the tunnel, the first um, half of it is in London clay, and then you'll see that the geology changes quite a lot. And you can see that now it's going down into sands and gravels and a fault. Um, and uh, it, it, it has a quite complex geological uh, route once you get away from the West End. So what we're looking at here is going from West to East. And it ends up in fact in chalk, that light green is in fact chalk. So there's a very big variety of different geologies. I'm just going to show you, show you this one more time. So this is the West End starting in London clay for the first 500, about five kilometers. And then as we traverse to the east, you again, you will see the tunnel alignment moving um, into different geologies. And typically the tunnels are about 
40 meters below ground. And the reason they're that deep is that they have to go under a lot of existing um, subway tunnels. So this is just to give you a flavor of the complexity of the geology uh, of the Crossrail project, which involves a huge amount of, of geotechnical investigation, huge amount of boreholes. So one, most of the stations um, are in the London clay, that very stiff material I told you about, with one exception, uh, Farringdon Station. And this, this is a plan view of Farringdon Station, which was in a different, it, it's directly in that fault zone that I pointed out. And that means that it's it's in a in a very very mixed and complicated geology involving a lot of um, sand lenses, all of which would be under high water pressure, where typically the water level is very close to ground level. And I'll uh, come back to that problem a little bit later. These are the earth pressure balance tunneling machines used for the project for the running tunnels between the stations. Um, seven meters in diameter. And uh, for those of you not familiar with the principle of the earth pressure balance tunneling machine, the EPB tunneling machine, I'll give you a very brief description here. Essentially, they are completely closed face, as you could see from the previous photograph. And they closed with a wheel turning with cutters on it. And they principle of this machine is that there is a uh, an actually a a bulkhead, a solid bulkhead, and on the on the cutting side there is water pressure and soil pressure. These are quite high pressures which are resisted uh, by the machine as it's moving forward, and the high pressure water and soil is then removed by means of a screw conveyor from the high pressure right down to atmospheric pressure and onto a conveyor belt and, set and, that and carried down the tunnel. And all the time, as this is moving forward, there are jacks pushing against the concrete linings that have been erected. And when there is sufficient room for the next lining, the, the jacks are retracted and the next lining is put in. But the main point to to convey here is that, that there is a, a pressure maintained on the face to resist earth pressures and also to resist water pressures. And these EPB tunneling machines are now very advanced in technology and they've enabled us to be able to tunnel through much more difficult ground conditions than in the past. Here's a view of one of those machines being lowered um, down uh, into uh, a shaft uh, 40 meters deep. You can get an idea of the scale by looking at the, at the, uh, the people in, in, on the site standing around the shaft watching this machine weighing 550 tons being lowered down into the shaft. This is a view a little later looking down that same shaft and you can see both uh, two machines, uh, they've been lowered and they've been assembled. Uh, it's quite a complicated uh, machinery that goes on the back of all the machines. And those two machines are ready to, to start tunneling, um, going to the left of the picture uh, uh, into cent towards central London. Stations, as what I've just been describing, are the running tunnels, machines that, that construct the tunnels uh, between the stations. The stations themselves uh, are much bigger, uh, about 10 meters in diameter. And they're also, as you can see from the photograph here, um, quite uh, elliptical in shape. And that's partly for, for economy, in order to be able to optimize the, the, the shape rather than being circular. And this is made possible by the technique of sprayed concrete lining, uh, which is a a means of creating quite quite uh, different shapes as part of the uh, final design, but also for the temporary construction. And you can also see 
in the in the plan the the whole layout of the station and and the station is about 200 meters long which is pretty long for for a, a normal subway station this is not a normal subway this is train size and the stations are much longer and uh, and i'm going to just give you a snapshot here of of how the, the technique of using sprayed concrete is very versatile so if you're constructing a large cavern of a, of a region of around 10 meters you can construct smaller ones first so on either side here you see um, egg-shaped on the right hand side you can see it more clearly an egg-shaped tunnel that was constructed first and there's a similar one on the left hand side and then they then eventually get demolished uh, and and the bigger one the full size tunnel is then constructed but the the sprayed concrete linings um are extremely versatile in being able to create different shapes and and have different construction techniques but you get an idea of the size by looking at the at the size of the operatives down at the bottom of the photograph one to really show you here is is a um a large uh, a, a very large cavern uh, 15 meters in diameter which is a crossover cavern to allow uh, the trains to to switch tracks and so it's 15 meters from one side to the other and it's about uh, uh, almost a little less than 15 meters from top to bottom but the reason for highlighting this is that this was in a complicated geology only the top two thirds were in that strong clay that I was describing earlier so that strong clay London clay means that you can do these spray concrete linings in free air without having to worry about unstable ground but the lower third in the Lambeth group was in very much more complicated and more treacherous ground with extensive sand layers under high water pressures so the way in which this was constructed was to divide it into these different um, types of tunnel. You can see the, the, um, the egg-shaped one on the left, the egg-shaped one on the right. And they were constructed first. And then from number one and number four, what was then done was that there were special um, inclined vacuum well points at four meter centers that were drilled in down into the Lambeth group to depressurize all of those uh, difficult sand layers full of water pressure. And when that was done, the ground was then uh, converted from being very treacherous and very difficult to do in open, uh, open mode to a, a much more manageable uh, material. In other words, if you if you deal with the water and you you remove the water pressure, then sand is completely okay to deal with. But the cru the crucial point here was the the inclined vacuum well points that were installed first, and that was the end product of a very large cavern. Uh, you can get an idea of the scale by the by the people in the invert of the completed tunnel. Now I'm now going to just give you um, a flavor of the settlement effects that I said I would talk about and, and the prevention of damage to buildings. So at this point, I'm going to pay tribute to a, a mentor of mine who, who I learned from whom I learned a huge amount, Sir Alan Muir Wood, who was a very distinguished civil engineer and tunneling expert. He was a graduate at Cambridge University. He was the president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And he made a very powerful statement. He said, it has been said that a tunnel is a long cylindrical hole through the ground with a geologist at one end and a group of lawyers at the other. He then said, yet more dire is the present day phenomenon of lawyers at each end. Now, that's particularly relevant when it comes to tunneling under a whole lot of extremely valuable buildings in central London. So there was a lot of um, sophisticated 
modeling and analysis done. Uh, nowadays, we, as many of you will know, there are very, there, there's a lot of software around. Uh, one has to be pretty careful about the assumptions that one makes, but essentially, uh, three dimensional finite element analysis, if it's done well, can be an incredibly powerful, uh, extremely powerful uh, means of making these assessments. Involves complex modeling of nonlinear stress strain behavior of the soils. We often use models like the CAM clay model. We need to know the soil stiffness properties. We need to know the horizontal in situ stress. And crucially, we need to know the soil permeability. And that really dictates an awful lot of, the, of, of how successful a tunneling project is. And I'm at this point going to talk about how we protect some buildings. Some of the predicted movements were going to be very large, which would have damaged the buildings. Many of you will be familiar with the principle of compensation grouting. But essentially, what this means is that if you're going to construct a tunnel beneath a building, before you do it, you might be assessing that there, there would be severe settlement without compensation grouting. So before any tunneling, a shaft is excavated. You can see that on the left-hand side of the, of the slide. And from that shaft, um, tubes are drilled into the ground, known as tuba manchettes. These are sleeve tubes, and they're all installed in the ground prior to any tunnel being constructed. And then as the tunnel is constructed, injections are made from those tuba manchettes in order to compensate for the movements that the tunnel is causing and thereby you prevent those movements from getting up to the building itself and you can see that there is a, sl a solid line sh saying slight settlement with compensation grouting so you reduce the very what would have been very severe settlement to much much less damaging settlement that's the principle of compensation grouting it was used extensively on this Crossrail project. Bond Street Station, many of you who know London will know that Bond Street is in the middle of Mayfair. It's probably the most expensive real estate in the whole of London. And so if you look carefully, you can see that there are little white circles, five of them, and these were all shafts. And from those were drilled before any tunneling, uh, these tubes, you can see these little black lines going out from every one of those shafts, protecting all those buildings shaded in blue were all being protected by compensation grouting. And you can also see in the same slide the outline of the station construction, the two big platform tunnels on either side with the cross passages in between and various escalators as well. Now, one thing that was particularly innovative uh, on one of the stations, this is the slide I showed earlier, Liverpool Street Station, which involved, it was constructed, this station was constructed underneath a number of very important buildings, and it wasn't possible to do the conversation grouting in the way I've described. So a completely new and novel idea was put forward by the contractor. So this is a big, um, it's called, um, it's actually called Finsbury Circus. So this is, in fact, a series of very big office buildings on massive foundations. And actually that the contractor put a shaft down in the middle. This is a cross section below here. And this is the actual tunnels being constructed for the station. But halfway down, they constructed some special tunnels shown in blue specifically for the compensation grouting. So they were, uh, this is pretty innovative. They actually elected to construct these small tunnels, four meters in diameter, to, to actually install the compensation grouting. So from within these tunnels, you, you can see these operations going on. They were dedicated only for compensation grouting. And so you can see over here on the right hand, bottom right hand side, you can see holes uh, 
you can see on the left hand side a grout tube going into another hole and the top left is a guy who's controlling the grout injections and it, it was a very successful operation but what was impressive was that from those tunnels you can see all of the grout tubes that were drilled to protect the buildings that you can see in the photographs the three big buildings there this is unusual and very innovative to actually construct temporary tunnels specifically for the purpose of protecting the buildings from construction of the much bigger tunnels beneath. You can see the outline of the station, the two big platform tunnels uh, shown in blue uh, superimposed on here. So that was one very big innovation. And now I'm going to talk about another issue, which is pile foundations. This is a great picture that Keller, Keller produced. Many of you will know Keller. And you just got to imagine that you are one of these three people standing down here. And you've got to imagine that all the soil has been removed. So what you're left with is the myriad of other obstacles in the ground when you're contemplating a new tunnel project and you can see the pile foundations supporting high-rise buildings you can see other tunnels and what was very challenging for the crossrail project was that we were often tunneling extremely close uh, sometimes directly beneath pile foundations so that takes me to some work that we did at my university in Cambridge, uh, which was directly of value to the Crossrail project. We have a big geotechnical centrifuge in Cambridge. This is um, 10 meters in diameter. Uh, it, it's a, uh, an amazing piece of, of, of equipment, which enables us to, to uh, model scale, to take model tunnels, uh, at reduced scale, typically one hundredth of the full scale, and then accelerate them to a hundred times G, and that way you get the same stresses that you would actually get in in the, the real problem. So, what we were specifically looking at was the effect of a tunnel being constructed underneath a loaded pile in clay, and on the right hand side you can see a close up of a pile it's a half it, it's a circular pile cut in half up against a glass screen and you can see the 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 pie the, the tunnel 62 millimeters in diameter this was actually tested at 75 g so that means it's it it, it it's uh it's typically uh modeling something like a a five meter diameter tunnel at full scale it involves a big package you see on the left that whole package that goes at the end of the centrifuge weighs about a ton and so it's a, it's got a lot of clay it's got a lot of instrumentation and it's um can tell us a great deal about what happens when you construct a tunnel under controlled conditions beneath a heavily loaded pile in clay so just at this point i want to just introduce you to, to the concept of volume loss so normally when you construct a tunnel, um, you get a settlement trough shaped like this. And there is in fact a, it's like a Gaussian distribution. And we can very quickly establish that there is a volume of ground in that settlement trough. And that volume is sometimes expressed as a, as a proportion of pi d squared divided by four, which is the, the volume of the tunnel. And that's a very useful indicator as to how much deformation the tunnel is causing. Typically nowadays, that volume loss is only around 1% for modern earth pressure balance machines. Typically 1%, sometimes even less. So what I'm gonna show you now are some images of a centrifuge test in progress so that the, you, you'll see the volume loss in this bottom right box here increasing steadily. And the image analysis means that we're able to get a complete picture 
of all the deformations being caused of the ground and the pile as the tunnel is being constructed with increasing volume loss. You can see it's now going up to quite high values to, to um, up towards 3%, 4%. And on the right-hand side is the, uh, is, the, is the measure of the movements, the red being the higher movements. The point of all that is that we get an extremely accurate picture as to what actually happens when you put a when you construct a tunnel beneath a loaded foundation. Now I don't expect you to look at all these graphs, but if you look at the the one in blue on the left hand side, what is plotted there is the change in the load on the pile because it has a load on it, and as the volume loss increases, you can see that the pile the load in the pile starts to decrease because of effects a bit like negative skin friction. So as the ground is moving around the pile, it's actually tending to put the pile more into tension. It actually stays in compression, but it is reducing the load in the pile. And on the right-hand side, there is a, uh, in black, is the completely different response of a pile to one side of the tunnel, which actually, increases the load quite significantly, the compressive load in the pile. So the message from this quite complicated slide is that the response of piles to tunnels constructed directly beneath them very much depends on the position of the pile in relation to the tunnel. And so I'm now going to just show you a case in Crossrail of exactly that kind of problem. So this is a block of uh, residential apartments constructed uh, in 1996, load-bearing masonry. There was no basement, four-story buildings, and the building was piled. And this is a view of, of, this, of the setup. So the left-hand picture shows you the layout of the building. It's a bit complicated geometry. Uh, these are going to be very big tunnels going beneath it. The cross section on the right hand side of the slide shows the big 10 meter diameter tunnels, which you can see were constructed um, intersecting even some of the piles. And they were constructed with six meter diameter pilot tunnels first and then enlarged to the full 10 meters. Most of the piles were within four meters of the tunnel crown. Some of them were even intersecting the tunnel crown. So some piles had to be cut. You can imagine that we had some interesting discussions with the owners and the residents of the building. But the really, we learned from those centrifuge tests that we predicted there would not be uh, a very big problem. And it turned out to be exactly that case. So what we are looking at here are three different cross sections through the building, comparing the actual settlement of the building with the green field results. In other words, we were also measuring not just the building response, but also the response of the ground slightly away from the building. And the, and the, the big the big message to take away from here is that the, the piled building responded almost identically to the surface of the ground. So if you, if you took away the, the building and the piles, the settlement that you would get was almost the same as the piled building. So that despite the concerns that a lot of people had, the actual response of the heavily loaded piles and the building that they were supporting was the same as the ground surface in the absence of any piles or building, which was very reassuring because it meant that nobody had to be evacuated from the building, which is what we had predicted. But the centrifuge tests were extremely instructive in giving us that insight. And finally, I'm just going to talk about some innovative fiber optic sensing. So this is the same station I showed you earlier, Liverpool Street Station. And I'm going to focus on 
a, a very tricky area shown in that big red circle, which is where you have three big tunnels uh, very close to each other with cross passages between them. So we're looking here at the, <clears throat> the, the concourse tunnel, CH5, um, and, and the westbound platform tunnel, the eastbound platform tunnel, and then what happens when you knock holes between them all, which are those cross passages, CP1, CP2. Now, this involved a lot of uh, work by the designers, by Mott McDonald, the consulting engineers. It involved a lot of three-dimensional um, finite element analysis, very complicated, sprayed concrete properties, soil properties, highly nonlinear. And they were able to conclude that when you knock a hole in between tunnels, you have to have especially thickened areas of, of concrete in order to allow for the stress concentrations. What we were able to do was to install fiber optics to actually assess how much that was really the case and to validate the analysis. So this is looking at the central tunnel, which is pretty much 11 meters in diameter. And you can see two of my colleagues from my group in Cambridge fixing fiber optic reinforcement, uh, fiber optic cables, I should say, uh, on, the, on the first pass. So there was already one uh, sprayed concrete layer, but they, before the actual uh, cross passages, we put fiber optics uh, all over it to measure what happens. So the, the cross passage positions are shown in red, cross passage one and two. And what we were able to do was to assess to what extent the thickening of the concrete was really needed by measuring very accurately the strain with the optical fiber. And these optical fibers have fantastic potential. So if you launch light down an optical fiber, 95% of it gets transmitted. Some of it gets back scattered, shown in the red arrows. And if we, if we then plot the power of the backscattered light against frequency, we get these special peaks called Brillouin peaks and Rayleigh peaks. And the point, the important point is if it gets strained, if the glass fiber gets strained, these peaks shift in position. So you, you have a, a, a special um, analyzer shown on the bottom left, and that sends waves down the optical fiber. And if any part of it gets strained, then it moves, it actually, uh, you can see the shift on the bottom right there. The Effectively, it means that the whole fiber optic is acting as one continuous strain gauge. It's a very powerful technology. And it meant that we were able to put optical fiber all the way around prior to those two openings, CP1 and CP2. And when they were actually uh, not through, we were then able to see exactly what strain was induced in the sprayed concrete. So this is the end result. This is a plan view. You can see the, the, big, the big tunnel, the big 11 meter diameter tunnel with the two cross passages knocked through on either side. And the, the green was the ordinary sprayed concrete. And then the, the, um, the blue showed to what extent the additional strain actually happened because of putting in those, those extra uh, openings. But the finite element analysis and the complicated um, design that was done before any of construction reckoned that they had to thicken the whole of that red part. So it, it turns out that that's quite a lot of excessive concrete and that's got quite a cost that goes with it. Um, so improvements for future sprayed concrete openings like this, we can be 
enormously enhanced by such measurements. So we, we will need less material, less excavation, less time, safer construction. But the, the, the power of putting fiber optics in to inform us on that kind of um, uh, measurement is, is invaluable. So I, I'm just going to summarize because I know time is running, running out. Um, creating urban underground infrastructure is increasingly challenging, especially going beneath so many important buildings uh, and in difficult geology. And the Crossrail project was an excellent example of many innovations. I hope I've emphasized in the short time the key role of geotechnical engineering. You know, it's vital to understand the geology, the ground conditions, the soil properties, and their behavior. It's now possible to control building settlement with compensation grouting in a very uh, success, in a very good way. And what I was able to show you was an innovation to actually construct temporary small diameter tunnels specifically for compensation grouting was, was a, a completely new development. And I hope also that you've seen that the effects of tunneling very close beneath power foundations is now much better understood. And finally, innovative fiber optic monitoring offers huge potential for the future. So with that, Alan, I will stop. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very clear, straightforward presentation, but uh, don't be fooled folks. There's a lot of uh, innovative and complicated work and thinking behind all that. I'm very impressed by it. Um, I uh, remind you to uh, throw in some questions if you uh, have them. Uh, we will try to get to as many as we can. Uh, I'll start with a few and uh, see how that question list fills up here. Um, and, and, and again, just I, before, in the case we get cut off, I just want to thank you in advance, uh, Robert, for an excellent presentation. Um, how many TBMs were used in the 42 kilometers of tunneling and uh, what was their size? Uh, there were there were eight TBMs used um, and they they were seven meter diameter. Um, they were they were all heron connect machines some of the the uh, listeners of this webinar will know heron connect a very very successful german company that that um that is, is one of the world leaders in in uh, tunnel boring machines particularly earth pressure balance machines but also slurry shields yes I and mean, we have some experience with those in here in the united states and it's really interesting how we can actually use feedback now on those machines and limit ground move motions or movements to very small quantities. It's huge forward progress. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. It, it, it's been a very big, very big development to be able to, I mean, frankly, in, in the Crossrail project, the settlement effects coming from the, 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 the running tunnels, the, in other words, the TBM machine tunnels were, of no no consequence, no problem at all. The 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 challenges were those big stations. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of those stations, uh, you know, was there some lessons learned uh, comparing uh, those stations? As I understand it, some of the stations were actually opened up by tunneling versus some that were cut and cover. And did you see differences in those two approaches? Very big differences. Um, I mean, there are pros and cons, and I guess that's what lies behind your your question. The, to do the stations as a cut and cover operation, in other words, starting from the ground surface and putting down um, slurry walls, diaphragm walls, and propping them all the way down to, to a depth of maybe 40 meters is a, is a big, big undertaking, highly disruptive, of course, to the, to the um, infrastructure all around. Um, and in many ways, the mine stations is a is a much is a much smarter and more convenient and better way of constructing stations. Uh, it didn't always. It, it turned out there were only two of these stations were done by cut and cover. The rest were done by mined operations. 
and and they and the mind tunnels were were undertaken extremely well and uh by and large it's a lot it's a lot more desirable than going by cut and cover especially in minimizing surface effects on traffic and pedestrians and other things right exactly and yeah. services and all of the things that you know they i mean they services are in the engineer's nightmare as we all know especially in an old city like london um so the cut and cover operations uncovered all sorts of history all sorts of uh, old skeletons from hundreds of years ago well if you're doing a mine tunnel at a depth of 40 meters you don't have that problem yeah very good point we have that here in our old cities like new york old for us but uh, just a nightmare. You say for the engineers, I'd say more for the contractors. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, what were the most difficult uh, geological groundwater conditions that the project had to deal with? And were, were these unanticipated, any of these unanticipated? I would say they weren't un unanticipated. You know, we had a very extensive program of site investigation. Um, I'm pleased to say that this was a very enlightened client. Uh, they, they really understood the point that um, it's worth paying the money for comprehensive site investigation and understanding the detailed geology with lots with lots of pizzometers installed in boreholes, so the hydro the hydrology was well well understood. So I would say that there was nothing um, un unexpected. There was some difficult the the one that I demonstrated briefly where you had the the uh, the sand lenses uh, under high water pressure, and that, and they had to be especially dewatered with vacuum wells, but that was all anticipated. We we knew that that would be needed. So a lot's been done, researched on London clay. Uh, even U.S. students study London clay in geotechnical engineering. It's a well-known material. But did you have any surprises? Did you learn something new about London clay from this massive project? I think we did. Um, we always learn more things about it. Um, sometimes you can get clay stones within London clay. And so it, these are really very, very um, cemented, hardened, and not, not a problem to excavate, but sometimes water can go with them. So London clay normally is an extremely low permeability, um, it's very strong clay. And then sometimes you can hit clay stones with quite a lot of water flowing through the clay stones. And so th there was a bit of that in some of the cross rail tunneling, but broadly, there were no big surprises. Good. Um, what happened to all the tunnel muck? It's an enormous volume of material. It was. It was, it was um, something like um, 7 million tons of, of material. And it was stipulated at the outset, because it was in central London, that there wasn't allowed to be any trucks removing any muck through the streets of London. So they had a very well organized, well thought out system of the muck all going out to the portals. And, and some about half of that uh, muck was taken off by train down outside to well outside London. The other half was taken by a river. So the River Thames, big river flowing right through through London, as many of you will know, of course, and about 3 million tons of muck was taken by barge down river to a bird sanctuary, which, which uh, is on the estuary of the Thames, about um, 15 miles towards the sea. And that bird sanctuary is now one meter higher than it was. So the muck was spread throughout the bird sanctuary. And uh, it was a very um, environmentally you know, satisfying way of dealing with the muck. Interesting comment. We have a big project here in Boston called uh, Bird, uh, called Big Dig. Much of our muck went to a place called Bird Island Flats. <laughs> maybe, huh. maybe that's our tunneling friend usually is where the birds go, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. The um, question here, um, you know, any comments relative to seismic effects uh, on the design and impacts? Um, um, you know, you know, England's not that much seismic, but, but how did you consider that for the design? 
it's a it's a perfectly good it's a very good question but we are very fortunate as you've just said we are very fortunate in that in that um the uk is seismically very inactive compared with the us and compared with many countries in fact i mean countries much closer to to us in the uk uh in europe you know some south of france italy uh, have to worry a lot about seismic um design but I can honestly say that the the uh, the seismic considerations for Crossrail were minimal because the the um, the the risk of, of of seismic activity is extremely low. Yeah. Was um, during the the very interesting compensation grouting program there? Did you have cases where you heaved the ground, and how did you prevent that from happening? Um. It's a really good question because if grouting, we we all those of us that know a lot have experienced a lot of grouting, it, it can it can do things that you don't don't expect. Um, there were very careful. Uh, there was a lot of measure, a lot of measurement, a lot of monitoring, and and uh, certainly there is a a risk of heaving the ground if you get over enthusiastic about the grouting. That uh, the we didn't in fact experience that. Um, so what you're aiming to do is to create probably a small amount of, of heave, perhaps up to about 10 millimeters, but no more than that. And but to do it in a very um, incremental way to be grouting a little bit, tunneling a bit more, grouting a bit, tunneling a bit more. So you don't do anything violent. You don't violently heave it. You don't allow violent settlement, but you keep everything pretty much in a in a in a uh, a minimal amount of movement and that really requires real-time monitoring and a good instrumentation program to stay on top of it right it certainly does it yeah. certainly does um I, i'm sorry to be the one asking these questions but we have tried to do this with the questioner asking the questions and it's just too much time consumed in sure. the technology so um so i'm i appreciate the questions that are coming in forgive me for uh pulling them all off and asking, but it helps it go smoother. That's um, fine. Are there, um, were there special considerations given in the fault areas you pointed out? Yes, they were indeed. The, the fault areas, uh, that station that I briefly showed you early on in the presentation called Farringdon Station was founded exactly in the fault area. It would, it would in an ideal world, not be the greatest place to, to found, to, to site the station but there were other constraints. So it was difficult. It meant that the ground was very faulted. It was not London clay, just to make matters more complicated. So there was a, there were, there was a lot of water, a lot of sand, gravel. Um, and so the way in which that was handled was that the TBM tunnel <coughs> tunnels were constructed with earth pressure balance machines right away through the station so you had you had before you did anything else you had uh, a completed segmentally lined pair of tunnels and then from within those i didn't have time to show this from within those there was then drilling radially out from those segmentally lined tunnels to to depressurize all of the faulted ground and all of the water pressured all of the permeable zones of sands and gravels and then those tbm tunnels were then dismantled uh, progressively but they were used as the as the as the way of effectively making the ground stable and 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 uh, the right condition for 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 bulk excavation for the main tunnel yeah oh, um, the um Turn to a few questions about the instrumentation, something that you've spent a lot of your career on and being the head of the um, uh, CSIC there, the, the Cambridge uh, Center for Smart Infrastructure, um, which I've had the pleasure of visiting. Um, very impressive work you all do. Um, could you um, uh, talk about any other innovative monitoring uh, work you did here uh, in addition to the fiber optic strain measurement? Yes, there was a lot of um, again, I didn't have time to in, in this brief presentation to to show you 
uh, other things. I, I, I chose to focus on the fiber optic uh, instrumentation. But in addition to the fiber optic, which itself was very successful, not just in that case I showed of the of the breaking out of cross passages from tunnels, but it was also used for um, slurry walls, diaphragm walls. We put fiber optics into the reinforcement cages that went down into the into the into the diaphragm walls. So we were able for the first time by putting the fiber optic on the intrados and the extrados, we were able to see exactly the, the full bending profile uh, and deformation profile of the diaphragm walls. But you asked the question about other forms of instrumentation. We also had a lot of wireless tilt meters that we used. And this is a such a big advance to be able to not have lots and lots of wires, as you will know very well, Alan. So the, the, the advent of wireless technology has, has made such a big difference to, to being able to have a, a really well thought out monitoring program without just so many wires, it just gets in everybody's way and the contractors just get upset by them and they get cut by machinery and all the rest. So wireless technology was a, was a big innovation on this project, yeah. Great. Um, you know, one of the questions I like to ask is, is on these monitoring systems, which are increasingly uh, used in tunnels, you know, but can we really quantify the benefits of them? They seem like a good idea to geotechnical engineers, but owners constantly question, why do we have to do this? So it, has, has there been any effort to try to quantify or capture the benefits in some way, like return on investment or a benefit cost ratio or something that we could communicate to non-geotechnical people why this is so important? I think it's I think it's a really good question you ask. I think it's not straightforward. Uh, it, it's very, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's, it's quite common for, for um, particularly the kind of financial people on a project to say, well, why are we spending the money on, on these instruments? And I think if you have a, an enlightened client as we did with Crossrail, who are, are almost certainly going to be the same client for the next project, rather similar to Crossrail, then they absolutely saw the value. They saw the value, uh, if for no other reason than the learning for the next project. So the example I showed of the cross passages, well, you know, the, the significant saving that could be made next time because of the measurements that were made this time were can certainly be quantified and can certainly show that that there is a big saving it's it's more difficult often to to make the case for the actual construction unless you are doing observational kind of construction and we did do that on crossrail so there were some good examples of deep excavations um involving four levels of props and the, the fiber optics were put into the diaphragm walls on both sides of the excavation and uh, also measuring prop loads and it, it was decided very early on to dispense with one of the prop levels completely which was a big saving both in time and in cost uh, but it was it would never have been possible without prop monitoring yeah, hopefully you've documented that in ways that uh, others can take advantage of that to help yes. sell the benefits of these modern approaches. Yes. You know, we're, we're almost done. Uh, just two more questions, if I can try to shove these in. Um, you know, waterproofing is always a big deal. Uh, did you have challenges here with waterproofing? How did that, how did you address that? How did that work out? Yes, it's, it's a big deal. You're absolutely right. Um, Fortunately, most much of the tunneling is in that very low permeability London clay, mm. which which means that the, the the issue of water is is not as acute, but still needs to be waterproof. So there were waterproof membranes. You know, there was a first pass of sprayed concrete, then there was waterproof membrane, and then there was a in situ in situ concrete permanent liner on top of that. Quite involved. Did but, you have a uh, drainage uh, net in somewhere in that yes. uh, sandwich too? So yes. it's the belt and suspenders that we find we really have to have to do to get these things watertight, right? Yep, that's right. 
That's right. Final question. And this one, I love this question. Are there two or three places I can go on my next trip to London to uh, see some of this work and see some of these practices? It's all covered uh, up, right? <laughs> it's all covered up. I was going to say, it's all covered up. But uh, you, you have to go on the Elizabeth, the Elizabeth line, as Crossroll is now now called. It's, uh, I know I'm a little bit biased, but it is, it is a fabulous bit of infrastructure. It, uh, everybody who's using it says it's wonderful. It's very, it's very spacious. Uh, the architecture of the stations, you know, the finished architecture is, is, is very, well, very well thought through. So it's delightful to travel on. But to see it under construction, we've got to have another project for you, Alan. You're absolutely right. You know, I take my kids or family through something I've worked on and they see all this nice finishes. Dad, what's the big deal? <laughs> this looks this, this looks like anything else, you know. <laughs> so, well, we thank you so much. Uh, very well presented and very clear, simple answers, direct answers. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the uh, attention of the audience. Um, you're, we, we've had about uh, 200, I counted, at the peak, and there's still about 170, so you, you held them on, um, Robert. Um, I would like to thank everybody again, and, uh, and, and I have to remind us that uh, the opinions, conclusions, recommendations expressed uh, here um, are those of the, of the folks, me and Robert, I guess, are the only ones that spoke, and do not represent the conclusions or recommendations of the National Academy of Science, uh, Engineering, and Medicine. And with that, we'll stop. Thank you again for your participation. And uh, again, I thank you, Robert, for a, a very nice presentation. It's been a pleasure, Alan. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.